I'm excited to introduce today's dynamic keynote speaker, Veronica King. I met Veronica about 10 years ago through a dear mutual friend. Um, I thought of inviting Veronica as a keynote speaker because she has so many amazing qualities. For one, she's like the most wonderful mother to her recently turned 21 daughter, Amber. Veronica is one of the strongest women that I know, personality wise. She's very principled. She's not afraid to speak up. She stands her ground when she knows that she's right. And she stands up for those without a voice, which is something that I really admire about her and really inspires me. Veronica to me is the epitome of courageous leadership and I'm proud to have her call me friend and to be able to call her a friend as well. So Veronica, over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sheila. I was feeling a bit emotional the way you're talking about me. Thank you. I'm really honored to be here. And I think I feel, I do feel a little bit emotional because woman development, speaking to women and young ladies is such a, an important um, part of who I am. As Sheila says, um, my name is Veronica King. My first title about which I'm extremely proud is that I'm a woman and I'm a mother and I'm a mother to a young woman. She's just turned 21 in December. So I was really honored to be invited to speak about courageous leadership today because I believe I've worked really hard to achieve what I've achieved in all my endeavors as a, as a businesswoman. So what I thought I would like to talk with you about today is maybe a little bit about my story, um, my background, um, the business that I have now and how I got to start my business and then to mention what are the things and the criteria that I think really help us understand what courageous leadership really is. So I will start by saying I, I grew up in Durban. I live in Johannesburg. I'm speaking to you from Johannesburg. I live in Bryanston. I grew up in Durban and I grew up in a really poor community and, and I grew up in apartheid. So as a, a black woman growing up in apartheid, to give you an idea of my context, I'm 58 years old. I was born in 1963. So I lived through the most part of apartheid. And I remember as a young girl living in a quite a poor community, often feeling quite um, envious of what the white people had. And I recognized that that started becoming a big occupation, a preoccupation for me, because I, I knew that I had the potential of achieving what other people had, and we were not allowed to have certain things. And what I started recognizing was, how do I identify role models? Because role models for me, I still believe today, are really quite inspiring because I'm a firm believer of, you know, we can't be what we can't see. So seeing people achieving, seeing people achieving, especially people that look like me, really bolster and give me the energy and the focus to know that I am capable, I've got the potential, and I am going to achieve it. So there's a big part of me that thinks there was an, I was very covetous of what those that were privileged had. But there's a part of that that I think had really fueled me. But what I also did, whenever I had a little bit of pocket money, which was very little at the time, I would save it. And I started buying ebony magazines. Anybody my age or maybe who, I can see Sheila nodding. Ebony Magazines was an African-American black magazine that showcased 
black excellence. And me seeing black women in the kind of graduation gowns and being called the CEO of this and the MD of that and the director of this, I started believing I can achieve this. There are people that look like me and more importantly, there are women, black women who were being, who were doing amazing things. And I hung on to that with both my hands, knowing that there's something inside of me that's gonna enable me to achieve that. And I think that really started helping me identify um, how I needed to choose my friends. Also living in a poor community, um, there, were, there, were different, there were people from different lived experiences, different backgrounds, different socioeconomic dynamics. And I fortunately went to a school in an area that was away from where I lived because it was in the middle of apartheid. And I was classified colored because I've got mixed genealogy. So I had to go into a colored area because that was one of the pain of the part time. We were all divided. And I'm sure you learn about this in your history. So there were the white people who always were in the front of the queue. There were Indians, there were coloreds, and then there were black people. I self identify as a black woman. And this area into which we went, they had, I could tell the difference of the socioeconomic dynamics. So I was really kind of intentional and deliberate about finding friends whom I knew would keep me away from what I could tell that the young ladies were and how they behaved in my area. So to so the point to which I'm gonna use this as a segue to start speaking about the steps to success to what I believe is about being courageous and the importance of courage. So for me, what I believe has enabled me to have courageous conversations and thereby has enabled me to be a courageous leader is that I, with all the different opportunities that, that I had received, I started recognizing what my purpose was. I really worked hard at identifying the things about which I was passionate, the things that really made me feel energized, the things that I started recognizing I could do quite effortlessly because there's certain things we can do and we know that they're a little bit of a challenge and we still do them, but there's other things that we do and we realize, oh, wow, I'm loving this. I'm feeling energized. And when I'm doing it, the end results are really good. So paying attention to the things that really energize us really starts driving us to our purpose. And if you'd watched the video of um, the lady from Harvard, forgive me, I've forgotten her name, Rita or Sheila, what was her name? Professor Nancy Kuhn. That's right, yeah. Watching her, I, I resonated with what she'd spoken about regarding purpose, having a mission, having a vision. I'm an executive coach. And one of the things I often speak to my coaches about is having a, doing horizon management. So while it's important that we are present with what we are doing, and it's important to have our feet firmly on the ground, that's part of our identity, knowing who we really are, having our feet firm on the ground, but keeping our eyes on the horizon or on the stars, or we also speak about our high dream, being clear on what your high dream is. So, so that would be one of the first things about courageous leadership. It's about being authentic. 
knowing who we are, what is our identity, what are our values, what do we stand for? Because we speak about values um, and we say that when you don't stand for anything, you will fall for everything. When we know our values, our values enable us to, to reset our compass. When we know the direction we're wanting to go in, we can start setting our compass to make sure we go in that right direction. So, so standing in our truth and being comfortable in our skins enables us to feel grounded. And that's the authenticity we speak about. Always standing in your truth. I often speak about wearing my garment of truth, not needing to do anything to try and fit in with some people or belong in a certain thing. And it's also about listening to your body and your heart. I'm sure we've all been in situations where our friends, peer pressure is a big thing. Our friends would want us to do something and we will go along because we want to get along and we want to belong in that group. But we can feel that it's really not aligned with something inside of us. And when we are clear of what our values are, we know what to say no thank you to and what to say yes to. So that's the first thing that I wanted to speak about regarding courageous leadership. And the things that we do and we want to do when we attempt them, we don't always get it right the first time. So that's where our resilience needs to come in. And resilience is a lot about our authenticity when we feel grounded. Because the other thing, when we're not feeling authentic, we assimilate. And you assimilate to fit into the majority or the dominant dynamic in which we are. And it's very exhausting. I know that because in my, when I left college and I worked, I assimilated. This was still in the early 80s. I was working in the travel industry, which was a completely white industry. I was this young black girl, had never traveled overseas. And I had to just fit into this environment. And that's because I needed the work. And what I realized in hindsight, I went along to get along, to belong to this dominant dynamic. It, I was blessed because I traveled overseas three or four times a year in the 80s before black people were traveling. We couldn't afford to travel. And in hindsight, because I do a lot of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging work now, I recognize in that time I wasn't being authentic. And I was self-rejecting. When we want to do and be like someone else, we are rejecting ourselves. And if we're wanting to wear our garment of truth, if we're wanting to be grounded, it's really important that we accept and love ourselves for who we are and what we look like. So when we attempt something that we're passionate about and it doesn't work the first time, it doesn't mean we failed. It means we are learning. If we can reframe the word fail to learn, we'd be a lot braver and we will try it again. So when we read about inventors of amazing technology and amazing things, we shouldn't assume that they, they achieved that at the first attempt, but they would never tell us how many times they failed. So being resilient, and coming back and recognizing what the learning is can really enable us to create so many more opportunities because that leads me to, I've spoken about authenticity regarding courageous leadership. I've spoken about resilience. 
And that leads me to the third point I'd like to talk about regarding courageous leadership, and that's our emotional intelligence. What emotional intelligence, the building blocks of that, the first building block of emotional intelligence is about self-awareness. When we become aware of who we are and who we want to be in the world and who we want to be in our relationships, when we, we're in relationships, in personal relationships, it's another big area of our lives as women where we unconsciously self-reject. So knowing who we are, being self-aware, the authenticity helps the self-awareness. The self-awareness also becomes, it's very closely aligned to our values. So we know what we want, we know what to say no to, our values becomes the filter of things that we are wanting to be engaged in and what we need to walk away from. And with that self awareness, we also be, we also learn about what are the things in the context that maybe make us uncomfortable, what trigger us in a certain way, that make us feel left out being excluded. And by knowing what those things are, we can protect ourselves by not putting ourselves in those situations. Or if we find ourselves in those situations, the next building block of emotional intelligence is self-regulation. So there's certain contexts in which I walk into and I can tell by the energy in the room and the people in the room, I'm going to be triggered here. I can tell there's a few people that are going to say things that are going to really kind of make me see red. So immediately, I would possibly sit at the back of the room. I won't be very vocal. I will just listen. And as soon as I hear somebody make a comment that is either sexist or against sexual orientation, I'm a social justice advocate. So I really am very vocal, as Sheila said, I speak for people who sometimes don't have the voice and the language to speak about gender issues, all the isms about sexual orientation, about trans people, about all, I'm a big advocate of the LGBTQI plus community, about race issues, about woman issues. So these are the things about which, so, Talking about self-regulation and emotional intelligence, if I am in a room where I can tell there's going to be a comment that's potentially going to trigger me, if it's men that are running the meeting and they might make a bit of a dismissive comment about what a woman had done, the self-regulation will help me just think, well, hmm, I was expecting that. So let me reply and, and respond in a very compelling, clear, lucid way. And without being self-aware, can you see, if I wasn't aware, I would walk in feeling, oh, I'm in this lovely meeting, somebody says something, I then reply in a quite of a heated way, which is not going to serve the context. More importantly, it's not going to serve how people will see me after that. So self-regulation is really important. And the next building block is how do we build relationships? How do we become socialized? And how, how are we socially? So those are all the things that are under. I mean, I could speak about emotional intelligence for a whole hour, I'm sure. So that's the third point. The next point regarding courageous leadership is about self-discipline. And discipline is extremely important in all aspects of our lives. It's discipline about how we eat. It's discipline about how we focus on our studies. And I'm sure we all know when we don't have discipline, when we're wanting to study for exams, our results are never as good as they potentially could be if we were a little bit more disciplined. There's discipline about our, our wellness, about our work we do, about how we interact with people, 
how we conduct ourselves in relationships. I'm very mindful of the audience that I'm speaking with at the moment. My daughter being 21, a few years ago, she was in the situation of kind of um, being approached by guys. So it was all very kind of well and good, but it was important that I kept on speaking to her about knowing who she wants to be in that relationship, being self-disciplined when she goes out. And you know, she was at the age of now wanting to try a bit of wine and ooh, vodka and ooh, gin. She was getting into all of this. And I was also, I kind of, you know, she'd have a glass of champagne with me occasionally because it was important that I introduced her to alcohol so that she had a good, healthy relationship with it and she would be self-disciplined because she would often come back and say, oh, mom, I can't believe my friends in my class are so drunk and da, da, da. And that's because they were not opened with, the, with, their, with their parents at home. So the discipline was out of balance when they were, when they were let loose on it. So self-discipline in all these aspects of our lives is so important. And courageous leadership is definitely enabled when we are disciplined. I've been running my own company for about 20 years now. And without the discipline of being up early in the morning, of meditating so that I can be grounded, of following up my clients' calls timely, I would never have built the database of clients that I have now. I wouldn't have been able to educate my daughter. So discipline enables us to really achieve our performance. And all the sports people we watch and we see, you know, um, Casta Semenya, the reason she is a world famous athlete today is because she's self-disciplined. If we look at all of our sportsmen, Sia Kolisa, he's the captain, you know, self-discipline enables performance. Self-discipline enables us to achieve our high dream, our mission, our vision. And the, the fifth point, um, the five points that came to mind for me regarding courageous leadership is about our commitment to our purpose. And in the video um, about which I spoke a minute ago, um, she speaks a lot about our, the purpose, the mission, the values, and also the self-discipline again comes back to, she spoke about investing in your gathering years. The way I understood that is that all the opportunities that I had been given from the time I worked in my first job in the travel industry in the early 80s. I obviously was given that job because of the way I was showing up. I showed up in a way that, so the way we show up, the way we carry ourselves, our values, um, our self-regulation, our emotional intelligence, our self-awareness, when we show up in a certain way, we attract opportunities. You never know who would be looking at you and they might have an opportunity and they'll think, oh, that young lady has got the exact sort of image and the way she is for what I'm looking for and you would be approached. And that is how I got my job in the travel industry. I struggled to find a job after school. I would call people and they would say, yes, of course. And you know my name because I was classified colored. My name is Veronica King. So I would call and they'd say, yes, Veronica, please come in. The interview will be on Monday morning. And I would arrive there. And because I was black, they immediately said, no, the job is taken. So they didn't know that I was black by my name. And because I was taught to speak very clearly. So there would constantly be that. So I ended up working in the accounts department at Miladies. And I was... Um, uh, the job I was doing at the time, you know, people have clothing accounts and I would be the one that would open the accounts and do the cards. We had a special card machine, you know, that looked like credit cards, your 
Woolworths account or Milady's account. I was doing that. And again, talking about how you show up, but the way I was conducting myself in that very, in hindsight, my starting job, there was a, a lady who was the PR or the marketing manager. And she called me aside one day and said, Veronica, I've been watching how you work and how you interact with our customers. Um, is this really the work you want to be doing? And I explained to her and I said, no, but it's the only job I could get at the moment. And I'm, I'm wanting, and I'm paying for myself. I was studying. And um, I, was, I was also, because studying was important, but in the early eighties, universities still only took a very small quota of black students and my parents couldn't afford it. So I had to work and educate myself. And Sally, I'll never forget her name, Sally Bennett. She, she said, so what would you like to do? And I said, you know, my, my sister had immigrated to Australia and I went to the travel agency with my sister and I thought, oh, I love the look of this office and the staff had smart uniforms. And that became part of my high dream. I thought I would love to work in an office like this, you know? And when Sally spoke to me, I said, I would love to work in an office, uh, in a travel agency. And she said, that's very interesting. I've just been working for a travel agency. Let me see what I can do. And to cut to the quick, because I'm also mindful of time, um, she then said the next week, she said, I've arranged an interview with you with my ex-agency and I got that job. So that's the point I'm wanting to make about the way we show up, we can create opportunities. And that then, you know, the, the video spoke about gathering your experience, the way you actually perform in each of the opportunities, you then start finding your purpose. Not many people know their purpose right off. So all I want to leave with you are those things. And to finally say, part of what was also spoken about on the video was about choosing your village. I speak about it by building your dream team. Work and surround yourself with people whom you can trust, people who will support you, people who you know will have your best interests at heart. So those are the things. So just to, to round up, Courageous leadership for me is about authenticity, about resilience, emotional intelligence, self-discipline, and the commitment to your purpose. And the commitment to your purpose is the commitment to yourself and your identity of who you want to be in the world. Thank you very much. Am I out of time, Sheila? I'm so sorry. I'm not going to be invited oh. back. No, no, no. You still have a few no. more minutes if you want to okay, share. Okay, good. Yay! Yes. <laughs> I started feeling a bit nervous about time. Sorry, sorry. Um, and yeah, I think maybe just uh, the few more minutes I have, I, I'd say to Sheila, there's a lovely video that I'd like to, uh, I'll, I'll post the link in the chat momentarily, and it would be lovely for you to watch it. And what stood out for me with this video is that it was a, a woman of color, an Indian woman who ran as a, who ran for congressman in, even that name is faulty, right? Congressman, congressperson in the US. And she, she didn't win, but she spoke about how brave she was by actually running to be elected. And she speaks about how little girls are taught to be perfect, whereas little boys are taught to be brave. I want my daughter to be brave. I've achieved what I have achieved because I am brave. I'm not risk averse, I take calculated risks. So it's important that we know that we have what it takes to be successful. Successful is not only for a, a, a select few people in the world. If we know what our purpose is and have a vision, if we have the information investing in our gathering years, the, all the experiences I've just shared with you have enabled me. And I mean, I've worked for Richard Branson. I worked in London. I had a business with Stedman Graham, Oprah Winfrey's partner. 
So these are the things, these are all the things that I've invested in my gathering years and that's enabled me to run my own business. And finally, I can't overemphasize building your dream team, building your, choosing your village. And it's a, there's a lovely African saying that it says, it takes a village to grow a child. And I think it takes a village to support our success. And especially as women, as girls, gender dominance, male gender dominance has been part of the system of working and of society for many years. It's our time to really stand in our truth and not to compete with men. We need men, but to respect and know that we are equal and we can do what men do. Do I have more time, Sheila? I'm done. No, so I'm gonna go to the um, question <laughs> and answer bit now. Uh -huh. No, you. Sheila, let, let's first give her flowers. Please, ladies, put on your videos. <laughs> let's give her flowers. Let's give her pula, rain, blessings. Come on, guys. That was brilliant, Veronica. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, blessings. There we go. Thank you. I receive those blessings. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> I love the pula. Yeah. Yes. University of Pretoria last year, that was their sign, you know, so some people pick flowers, we're still trying to figure out ours, but for Butsua, for UP it was Pula, yeah. Lovely. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, it reminds me, there's this wonderful Kenyan woman who became, I think the term, as you would know the term, she blew up Instagram because she was this comedian, and one yeah. of the things she says, don't send me regards, send me <laughs> the other day she, she also said the other day i follow her on instagram i can't believe i've just forgotten her name and she said, yes that one. Yeah. yeah and she says i have a type it's rich <laughs> i know so, so i know one last comment before we get i love her because she's so irreverent so she also had that lovely clip about people ask me what's my dream job. I don't dream of labor, she said. <laughs> so thank you very much for having me and I'd love to have more time with you to have questions. Thank you very much, Veronica. That was absolutely incredible and inspiring. And I'd just like, ladies, please put your hands up if you want to make a comment, if you want to ask Veronica any questions, if you want to repeat something that really stood out for you, something that resonated with you, please go ahead and, yeah, the floor is yours. Or, or if you're a little bit shy, you can write it in the chat. Um, yeah, let's give Veronica some feedback and let's get some more information out of her if we can. I see lots and lots of flowers and hearts and everything in the chat, but I'd like to you guys kick up. Shade's um, with us all the way from Canada, Veronica. Lovely. Hi, Shade. Hi, how are you? I'm good, thanks. How are you doing? Good. I just wanted to say that everything you said was very beautiful, and I really appreciate you coming out and talking to us. I feel like I know that I'm young among the mentors, but I think that these are life lessons that you need at any point in life, mostly when you're, when you're young and a teenager, but I think a, a refresher is always welcomed. I also wanted to know, um, what do you think, what is, uh, what are you most proud of learning? Like what's like a lesson that kind of took you some time to wrap your head around, but you got it? Mm. Lovely question. And I spoke about assimilation and I spoke about um, self-rejecting and I mentioned my garment of truth. So in 1994, it was our first democratic elections in South Africa and I was doing some TV presenting at the time and I managed a counting, a polling station, and a counting station. And I felt in my body, I was emotional all the time. And I 
almost felt that I was taking off my garment of assimilating and starting to wear my blackness with pride and without the shame of feeling invisible and inferior. And that for me would be one of the most powerful things that have happened. My internal transformation started then of really owning who I am unashamedly and centering blackness and centering black woman is still a very big part of how I show up and what I'm and the place I'm making for my daughter and you in the world and the next generation. Thank you, Veronica. Thank you. That's a very special story. Um, I see Homolemo has her hand up. Please go ahead, unmute and speak. Good day, everyone. Hello there. Thank you Hi. so much for the beautiful message. Um, it's very really hard being a girl. That's something I can say. Finding yourself, finding your mission, it's a very long process. But learning to love yourself and being comfortable is very really beautiful. So my question is, how do you find motivation? How do you stop procrastinating? Mm. So procrastination is a big thing for most people. And my daughter and I were speaking about that just the other day, because she said one of her friends actually, who's in Canada at UBC, called her at like three o'clock in the morning saying she just is feeling so demotivated. And I said to Amber, so what did you say to your friend? She said, you know, mom, there's, there's times even at university when I actually can't even bear the thought of approaching an assignment and I procrastinate. And I said, so what do you do to break through that, darling? And she said, you know, mom, you just have to do it. And she said, a few minutes when you just sit down and you really dig deep for that self-discipline about which I spoke a minute ago, you then break through that procrastination. And then again, it's about just standing up to what you need to deal with, which speaks about bravery, which speaks about self-discipline, which speaks about resilience. Resilience enables us to keep going. And those are the things, and just reminding yourself of your vision. What is your high dream? What is your horizon? And knowing that the way you do every little task, picture that as a step to what your dream is. Never take your eye off your dream. And, you will, and your path might do this every now and then, but keeping your focus there and your attention there will help the motivation break through the procrastination and I'm a big advocate of where attention goes, energy flows. Where attention goes, energy flows. I'm hoping that helped you. And I know it's not easy. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Veronica. Um, we have another question in the chat. Um, it's from Akaflu Lua. Do you have any tools like books or podcasts for the mentees to learn how to be more emotionally intelligent? Mm, lovely, lovely question. Um, there are a number. I can't think of them right now. I mean, Daniel Goldman is one of the um, authors of Emotional Intelligence, and he has been for a while. Um, so if you Google Daniel Goldman, he speaks a lot about um, emotional intelligence. Um, but there's also, you know, again, I spoke about being a social justice advocate. I spoke about the importance of centering blackness. And that is why Black Lives Matter is a very important movement for me. Lots of these things have also come from a very Eurocentric Western perspective, whereas a lived experience as a Black person is fundamentally different. So there's loads of other sources of information that I'm researching at the moment with which I'm resonating more, which is enabling me to, to be here with 
beautiful woman like you today. So I will keep on sharing these resources with Rita and Sheila, and Sheila will be able to share them with the mentors. And hopefully, because I've been a well-behaved lady today, I'll be invited to be a mentor one day. Sure, I'm sure. invited. Hint, 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 hint. <laughs> Veronica, if today if you even have time with us, we're going to put you in a circle so that you can actually get the live experience. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. No, you're yeah. you're in automatic. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So I want Veronica. to say, I definitely yeah. want to stay. Sorry, Sheila. Thank What's you for the good? invitation to stay, Rita. And I would love to accept the invitation, but I want to just say that at four o'clock, I would have to bow out because during COVID with all the deaths that all people have been experiencing, and because I'm a traditional healer, I'm a Sangoma, I, uh, I have started a meditation, a grieving meditation circle um, every second Saturday, and we do laughing and crying meditation. So people who have lost and are finding it difficult to grieve and because we're all on our own. So I'll have to bow out at four because I've got my meditation circle. So I will stay until then though. Thank you. Sorry, Thank you, Veronica. Um, Captain Andy, um, what was the hardest decision you have ever had to make along your journey and how did you go about it? So there's, there's many hard decisions. I'm trying to think, I always like to go with the first thing that pops into my mind. And I think the first thing that popped into my mind was accepting a job from Virgin Atlantic to go and live in London. I was in the advertising industry. I moved to Johannesburg from Durban and I worked in advertising. And I, because of my travel ex industry experience working in the travel agency, I was working in this ad advertising um, agency and we pitched on the Virgin Atlantic account and we won the account and I was then the account director. And after managing that account for a couple, only a year or two actually, they poached me and organized my work permit to go and live in London. And that was a big decision for me. This was in 95, 96 time. As I expressed earlier, 27th of April, 94, was a big moment for me, coming, having Nelson Mandela as our first black president. And I was very conflicted about leaving because I was so passionate, which I still am, about the healing and building of our nation. And I thought, good God, it's just the time of the start of fantastic black opportunities and yeah, I'm going to London. And so my bosses at the time as well said, this, this is a real brain drain example. But I thought I can't say no to this opportunity. You know, living in London, working for Virgin Atlantic, they, um, hired me to be, they appointed me to be their internal communications manager. Mm. And I'd had to work very closely with Richard Branson because as you all know, he's a consummate PR person. If he saw anything that looked like a microphone, he'd start talking about the airline and the staff would never know what was happening and they'd see it in the newspaper. So I had to always be at the press conferences and then I edited a magazine as the internal communications manager and it was called The Globe. So that was a big decision for me. I left at the dawn of democracy of South Africa, at the beginning of black people starting to be recognized. And it's 26 years on and it's still not at the level that it needs to be. And that's why I do the work that I do, helping some corporate South Africa transform to recognize that women add value and black people add value. We don't take away, we add. So that was a big, big, big decision for me. I was leaving my parents behind. My dad died while I was living in London. So that was a big 
um, a big decision. And then I also realized what it was like psychologically for me now living in a country where I was in the minority, having lived in a country for 30, I was about 32 then, having lived in a country for 32 years where I was in the majority. And, and the Virgin Atlantic offices were in Crawley, which was close to Gatwick where the airline started. And I lived in a village close to my office. And I, not many people had seen black, someone black before. So I would often see them pointing at me at the markets on a Saturday morning, you know? So that was a big, big decision. But I've come back and I have reintegrated and I'm still as ever so committed to our democracy. That was a big decision for me. Thank you for the question. <laughs>